From the nation's capital, Washington debates for the 70s. A series of programs designed to bring together for an open exchange of views or opinions outstanding authorities on vital issues facing the world of the 70s. The topic, Watergate and the political process. What can we learn from Watergate? Should we curb campaign contributions? What about public financing of campaigns? How should we deal with the dirty tricks problem? Now, here is Peter Haggis. The Watergate incident of June 1972 led to a series of traumatic events on the American political scene. Central to these events was the creation of the Senate Select Watergate Investigation Committee and the dramatic hearings which followed. The committee, of course, is part of the legislative branch, and while national attention has focused on the guilt or innocence of certain people, the committee's main responsibility has been to investigate the legislative implications. This raises important questions, questions which may affect the American political process for many years to come. For example, are new laws needed to prevent future Watergates? Should there be strict regulations on campaign spending? What about public financing of political campaigns? What general campaign reforms are needed? Anticipating such questions, Senators Sam Irvin and Howard Baker of the Senate Watergate Committee asked the American Enterprise Institute to help identify the legislative implications of the hearings. The committee requested a report on what it calls the options or alternatives that might feasibly be open for serious contemplation by the committee, plus the advantages and the disadvantages of each option. AEI commissioned a study for this purpose and named a panel of distinguished scholars to serve as consultants. The fruits of this task include a report by the project director, which has been published by AEI. The project director is Professor Ralph K. Winter, Jr. of the Yale University Law School. And now we come to the second phase of this project, a roundtable discussion of the issues by members of the panel who served as consultants for the project. Appearing in this discussion, Watergate and the political process are Charles S. Heinemann, a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Dr. Heinemann, who has served as president of the American Political Science Association, taught political science and government for many years at Northwestern and Indiana universities. Richard M. Scammon, director of the Elections Research Center of the Governmental Affairs Institute. Mr. Scammon served as director of the U.S. Bureau of the Census under Presidents Kennedy and Johnson. Aaron B. Wildofsky is Dean of the Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of California in Berkeley. Dr. Wildofsky has authored several books in the field of political science. James Q. Wilson is Chairman of the Department of Government and Professor of Government at Harvard University. He, too, has written several works, mostly on the political process. Ralph K. Winter, Jr. is Professor of Law at Yale University and is an adjunct scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Professor Winter once served as a senior fellow of the Brookings Institution in Washington and is now a consultant to the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Separation of Powers. The moderator of our discussion is chairman of the advisory panel, Professor Alexander M. Bickel of Yale University Law School. Professor Bickel, who served as a law clerk to the late Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter, is Chancellor Kent Professor of Law at Yale. He serves also as a consultant to the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on the Separation of Powers. Now, to preside over this discussion, Professor Bickel. Thank you, Mr. Hackus. All along the spectrum of opinion and emotion about Watergate, over the entire distance between embattled defensiveness and unqualified moral outrage, from the president himself to pickets calling for his resignation or impeachment, or preferably both, from one end of this spectrum of opinion and emotion to the other, and at most points in between, there seems to be fairly general agreement on one proposition, and that is that Watergate has demonstrated the need for institutional and procedural reform in the structure of American politics and government. Now, there isn't universal agreement, of course, on which reforms, on the nature of the reforms that are needed. Proposals are many and varied. But there is a 
remarkable consensus that reforms are needed and that Watergate has shown how needed they are, what the defects in our system are. We're here to discuss what may usefully be done, what reforms seem wise and appropriate, not necessarily only because Watergate has demonstrated the need for them, but also because Watergate has created a climate of opinion that is hospitable to reform, and it would be foolish to disregard that fact. But we're here also not only to sort out proposals and ideas, but also we hope, with some detachment, to ask the question that so often gets lost in the <coughs> excitement, namely whether deep-cutting reforms are really needed, whether we should rush into fundamental alterations in the structure and procedures of American politics and government, or whether we may not be engulfed or running the danger of being engulfed by an overreaction to Watergate. The cry is, don't just sit there, do something. Perhaps on some matters, the better advice, as someone once said to the late agitated actress Zazu Pitts, may be, don't just do something, sit there. Tonight, we're going to deal with the problem of campaign financing and spending. Chiefly the questions, should expenditures by candidates be limited, and should there be public financing of campaigns? Reform of campaign financing and spending, of course, would radically alter presidential politics, and so we thought it logical to go from that to a second topic, namely proposals for changes in the function and office of the presidency. Questions dealing both with the structure, perhaps a six-year term, been one proposal, and powers of the office. The second session will deal with the president's powers and functions in the area of domestic and national security, issues such as wiretapping and other emergency powers. Then with the problem of politics infringing on the Department of Justice, on the administration of justice, and the possible need for special prosecutors. And finally, with some matters of immediate interest, such as the reach of the impeachment power, its relationship to claims of executive privilege, and the accommodations that may be necessary between it, between the impeachment power, and the rights of defendants in criminal trials. Now, the centerpiece of our discussion, really the excuse for our being there, here, is the booklet by Mr. Winter entitled Watergate and the Law. And so on this issue of campaign spending, our first uh, issue, should there be limitations? Should there be possibly uh, public financing? As on other questions that we will uh, discuss, I will turn first to Mr. Winter to lead us off. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I think the question of limitations uh, on, um, uh, in the way of candidate expenditures and individual contributions um, uh, ought to be taken up. Uh, I think we ought to take them up separately, however, because I think they raise very, uh, very different problems. Uh, and I think it is important, since uh, virtually every bill now before the Congress, and in the judgment of a lot of people, every bill that is likely to pass, contains limitations on candidate expenditures. We ought to take that first. That seems to be the linchpin of, uh, of all possible legislation right now. Uh, the rationale for limiting candidate expenditures uh, is not entirely clear. Uh, there's a great deal of rhetoric about campaigns costing too much. Uh, it's not clear uh, how one judges that too much, uh, the campaigns cost too much. Do they mean, gee, you ought to spend more on defense, uh, uh, on social programs, and the like? Uh, and in addition to that, most of the evidence seems to indicate that uh, campaign budgets are not particularly excessive when compared with uh, commercial uh, advertising budgets. The principal justification, I think, for limits on candidate expenditures uh, go to the incentive question, to the, to, 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 to the idea that if you limit how much a candidate will spend, you will also limit the incumbent office holder's power uh, or incentive to go to people and ask them for contributions uh, 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 <clears throat> with the idea that some benefit uh, or some decrease of detriment uh, might be given in the future. Uh, that is to say, you decrease their incentive uh, to go out and raise money uh, uh, in the legal or unethical ways. Now, there are a number of objections, though, very cogent objections to limitations on candidate expenditures. The first goes to the problem of incumbency. Uh, 
The fact is that in any campaign, money is much more useful to the, to the person who was less known, to the person whose ideas have been circulated less widely, uh, than to the person who, than to the candidate who is well known uh, and who represents the prevailing viewpoint. Generally, that means that candidate that money is far more useful to challengers than to incumbents. So that there is the danger that if we limit expenditures, total expenditures by candidates, the limit will be set so low that incumbents will be given an advantage over over challengers. Uh, an extra advantage, indeed, at the moment, uh, incumbents have an enormous advantage anyway uh, because of subsidies from the government, office, staffs, and the like, and the fact that they have access to the media. Let me give you an example of this. The bill reported out by the Senate Rules Committee and sponsored by most of the groups which now clamor for campaign reform, uh, it's sometimes called the Kennedy Scott Bill, uh, provides public financing uh, to, the, to the extent of $21 million to presidential candidates. Uh, that $21 million is all the candidates can spend. Now imagine a campaign with an incumbent president eligible for re-election, faced by a challenger who has only $21 million to spend. The governor, after all, raised $38 million. Some was spent on primaries, but, uh, but even then uh, it is less than Senator McGovern had. The incumbent president acts, has access to Air Force One, can hold news conference, Conferences can do all kinds of things to run so-called non-political non campaign, uh, and he will just devastate the challenger, uh, who just will have totally inadequate funds. Now, it seems to me that this kind of a proposal, which we hear is, is, is a reform emanating from Watergate, uh, if it is passed, would be gee, a, a very cruel irony, because the effect of the proposal would be to increase the power of incumbent presidents enormously exactly the opposite lesson, one would think, to come out of Watergate. I think the incumbency problem has to be emphasized, because let's not forget that the only people who can vote limits on candidate expenditures are incumbent politicians. It is really too much to expect, I think, that we will get limitations uh, which will uh, 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 not seriously deprive challengers of the opportunity uh, to wage a fair campaign. Now, for instance, it's, it's, it's being said around here that uh, it takes $100,000 to unseat an incumbent member of the House. Uh, Can you be sure? Well, <laughs> one reason you might be sure is that if you look at all the proposals coming from the House, $90,000 is the the top limit. Yeah. I meant, is, is it guaranteed? <laughs> no, it no, it's not. It's not guaranteed, Alex. Uh, so uh, you can uh, you can keep your fortune uh, right, intact. Well, uh, I was just, just passing uh, it on. <laughs> Congressman Jimo can feel secure. That <laughs> <laughs> uh, second issue I think about expenditures that has to be raised is that to have an effective limit on candidate expenditures, you have to limit everyone else's ability to go out and spend money in a political campaign. That is to say, uh, uh, if, uh, if you want to limit candidate Scammon's uh, uh, expenditures, you have to also make sure that um, uh, his wealthy supporters, such as Mr. Bickle, are not going out and waging independent campaigns for him. You also have to have uh, 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 some kind of um, uh, uh, restraint so that so-called independent committees won't be set up uh, to run campaigns. Now, the effect of this is, uh, that every law putting a limit on candidate expenditures also has some kind of device which effectively prevents other expenditures or advertising expenditures by people not working on the candidate's behalf. Uh, I'll give you an example of, uh, of that. If the, if the ACLU, for instance, wanted to run an ad in the New York Times um, uh, uh, listing congressmen uh, who were, uh, who, who, who were uh, pro-busing, uh, 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 under, under the Kennedy Scott Bill and under present law, uh, they would be effectively restrained from doing so. Now, it seems to me that raises a very, very serious constitutional problem under the First Amendment. Uh, it's, a, it's a flat prohibition on peaceful political speech. Uh, it's rather unprecedented in, 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 in our history, I think. Uh, and, and it would seem to me that it is probably unconstitutional. I want also to add that, that I don't regard this as a legal technicality. Uh, it seems to me that the independent private advertising at a campaign may in fact tend to bring issues out more clearly than would be brought out if everything uh, were left to the, to, to the advertising firms working for the candidates. Uh, that indeed it may provide some flavor to the campaign and, 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 and information that we would not otherwise get.
So it does seem to me that the limitations on candidate expenditures raise very, very serious problems. Uh, and problems uh, uh, that, as of this date, uh, are so serious that we ought really not to enact them. I, uh, just to throw in one, one point, I'm uh, uh, very much of your view on the constitutional issue. And I think it's, a, it's just an inevitable one. Without, without limiting uh, uh, other people's expenditures, you don't have a real limit. If you do limit it, uh, it's a very serious constitutional issue. But on the incumbency point, um, I, I just wonder whether that's not a little uh, overemphasized. First of all, in the, uh, uh, to make a, a very simplistic point about it, uh, uh, not necessarily naive, but, but simple-minded, uh, if, if it's a real problem, uh, why can't I set a different limit, a lower limit, on expenditures by an incumbent than on expenditures by a uh, challenger? Well, I think, I, th I think that's a good question. You, th you say Congress won't do it. Well, I, well, well I think that's a that's good a question because it does point up the problem. If we're really interested in fairness, if all of the cries for reform and all of the rhetoric about cleansing the political process are true, why has not one single proposal seriously suggested that challengers be given more to spend and have higher spending limits than incumbents? Because you and I are the only high-minded people in the room. <laughs> <laughs> On, on the, well, if one, uh, if one uh, pushed that kind of a proposition, might uh, he not then, with equal with good reason, say that the man who is very attractive on TV ought to be held to less funds than the person, you know, who doesn't go over very well on TV? So, so that if Charles Lindbergh runs for president, he ought not to be allowed to spend a cent. But because in, but in no Congress. other candidate could uh, collect the amount of money necessary to match it. But incumbency is not an innate quality. It is a little different. It's not only not an innate quality. That it, what we're raising is the question of self-interest, that we are surrounding the, these so-called reforms with a rhetoric of high-mindedness, and they, be, they are being enacted by people who have an enormous self-interest in the, in the regulations they, the, the, uh, uh, that they contain. And there isn't anything that's happening to control that self-interest. This is a conflict of interest problem, really, when you ask the Congress to regulate this process. And it really, nothing to do with uh, uh, Charles Lindbergh. Well, I think one even could Edward well Kennedy. make the point that an elective body ought not to have any authority to control the elective process, whatever. But we have not arranged in this constitutional system for any other authority to well, do yes, that. Oh, yes, we have on apportionment. We've given it to the courts. We've done exactly that on the ground that presumably they're too self-interested. But that, again, that, that problem is soluble. If that's the heart of the problem, then we ought to try to arrange some kind of a commission that uh, it's like uh, congressman's salaries, uh, some kind of a commission that, that uh, does this and Congress has uh, uh, 60 days to uh, vote it down or whatever. I mean, take it out effectively uh, out of the uh, uh, real political process in Congress, if those are the problems. I, I think... I think uh, the incumbency problem and the, the fact that you expect action from self-interested people, those are soluble problems. Uh, they're not, they're there, but they don't seem to be decisive against the proposal. Well, I would, I'm not sure the problem is as easily disposed of as that. Uh, if you look at the history of Congress, you notice striking reduction in the proportion of freshmen, newly elected congressmen, who are returned in each session. Uh, some years it goes up, some years it goes down, but the turnover of congressmen is much less today than it was 20 or 50 or certainly 100 years ago. And there are many reasons for this, but one of the reasons is the substantial enlargement of the institutionalized congressional office. The local staffs in the home district, the staffs uh, in Washington, the free franking privileges, the travel allowances, the ability to use the studios of uh, Congress to make uh, a radio and uh, television tapes. Uh, a thousand and one ways are put at the disposal of the congressman to keep his name before the public. Now, it seems to me that no commission and no law could easily attach a value to these things such that their importance to the electorate would be compensated for by a lower limit on campaign spending during the actual campaign year. Well, I would think, Alec, that, you know, this comes down in many instances to what our British colleagues find. You hear a great deal of talk in this country about how limited the British campaign is. And it's true that during the three weeks of the campaign, expenses are limited. 
And during the previous four years, 208 weeks, if my arithmetic is correct, there's no limitation at all. The parties can go out and do anything they want. Under this circumstance, quite frankly, uh, what I'm more concerned with than limitations on the top. Because, you know, if you're going to limit money, are you also going to eliminate volunteers? Sure. Uh, let's say a man can get 100 volunteers to man his telephones instead of hiring them. So when he sets up his boiler room to operate on primary day, it doesn't cost him a dime. Now, he's obviously got an advantage. The incumbent has an advantage. There are all sorts of advantages. What, quite frankly, I would rather be concerned with on this whole question is not the, the ethic of limitation. I don't think this really is very meaningful. It's the providing of a floor for every reasonable candidate, public financing, if you want to call it that, without the inhibition on raising money, which I think has been written into almost every one of these uh, proposals that I have uh, I've come across. And there, it seems to me, you've got a, a proposition that without raising the constitutional question, which is a very real one. I'm a voter, for example, out in Montgomery County, Maryland, and if I want to join with some of my uh, colleagues in my town to vote for or against a candidate who's opposed to high-rises in our community, I see no reason why I shouldn't gather together. We all put in $5, we buy an ad in the local newspaper, and we say, candidate so-and-so is in favor of high-rise uh, zoning, and we're against him and vote against him. And I don't see why I should be held off to the pokey because I am doing what amounts to exercising my right to free speech, the only way most citizens can do it. I'd be much more concerned about the, the floor than I would about the ceiling. Aaron? Probably money is most important at the nomination stage. I think it can be said that there is no reasonably well-informed person who thinks that any presidential election in this century would have turned out differently because if uh, one or another candidate had more or less money. Indeed, as the Watergate uh, business <laughs> <had> uh, <laughs> reveals, having too much money is sometimes as uh, bad as not having enough. Now, at the nominating stage, of course, there are candidates who drop out because they can't raise the money. In some cases, this is probably good because it means they don't have the necessary support. In other cases, this could be bad if the electorate was deprived of a candidate whose general views might appeal to them, but who could not raise the money. I suspect that if one doesn't ask whether Joe Blow or Judy Brown was forced out, but ask whether candidates whose views are somewhat in tune with the electorate get nominated, despite the fact that some individuals lack money, the chances are that most political tendencies that could be imagined to have support in the electorate do get some sort of money. Nevertheless, it is quite possible that we've missed something and that the political process is skewed at the nominating stage. The mm. trouble here is that the difficulties of supporting parties <laughs> through the public purse mount enormously when you try to do it at the nominating stage because there's no way to screen because you don't want to pay people who shouldn't be running anywhere a lot of money so they can bring their nonsense to the attention of the public. Could I just add one codicil to what Aaron Wildofsky has said? I agree with everything he said except one trivial point, but I do want to clarify it because I think it represents a, a large misperception not just Aaron. Uh, I don't really think that what we've seen by way of dirty tricks and corrupt behavior and illegal behavior in campaigns is a result of having too much money or too little money or the right amount of money. I think if uh, Mr. Liddy uh, had been asked to bug the Democratic National Committee's headquarters uh, by a campaign organization that only had his tenth of his amount of money, he would have still done it and only charged his tenth as much. It's like the salaries paid to the star of a of a, of a popular television program. Uh, the salaries aren't determined by the amount of money necessary to get him, they're determined by the amount of money you happen to have, what you can uh, sell it to the advertisers for. In fact, I know of very few decisions in campaign organizations that are made on monetary grounds primarily. Most campaigns do the same thing, they do more or less depending on how much money they have. I do know of the decisions made in party organizations as opposed to campaign organizations that are made on the basis of money. Uh, the need there is to raise the money to keep a permanent cadre of persons employed for party business. And money is extremely important. 
uh, money used uh, in that way, it seems to me, is a way of strengthening parties and giving many people a stake in the rightness or wrongness, or more accurately, prudence or imprudence, of the decisions of those who are visible. But the amount of money at the disposal of the committee to elect X or Y, I think that's really, uh, within broad ranges, uh, a relatively unimportant consideration. Can, can, I can, can we move? a time when we were told that if you accepted, if universities and schools accepted federal aid, that didn't mean the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare was going to try to tell you who you should hire or fire. What, you, what kind of research you could do, how you could treat people in your research, or anything like that. And the point is, if the public is going to contribute its tax money, then it's going to want to further regulate political parties. Well, there are, we're into uh, uh, public, uh, public financing, obviously. Uh, there are other uh, problems. I'm going to call on Ralph in a minute that, that uh, uh, you mentioned, both legal and, uh, and policy ones. I wish you'd touch on the the legal ones, because they're, they're terribly tough and, and, again, probably decisive in themselves. Uh, well, public financing, uh, I would suppose, is, is at its worst when uh, it's combined with the kind of limitations on total expenditures that we're talking about. I say it's at its worst because uh, uh, the natural incentive of incumbents to keep low limits can, in that situation, be combined with the quite attractive campaign pitch that we're helping the taxpayer by not providing much uh, public financing, and indeed the public financing bills uh, now before the Congress uh, provide uh, terribly little financing. And, 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 and one other uh, rather cute little thing, uh, the financing depends on appropriations before every election, uh, so that uh, one can be proceeding along uh, uh, waiting for one's opposition to, to appropriate the money, not knowing whether you're supposed to go out and collect <laughs> money or not collect money. Uh, uh, but I, I, I suppose we shouldn't let a little thing like that stand in the way of reform. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, there, are, there are problems. Let me just raise uh, some issues, it seems to me, that go to, the, to, to what is the more difficult problem, which is public financing without limitations on expenditures. Uh, and these, I think, uh, divide really into four groups. Uh, one is the problem of eligibility. Um, uh, I guess, as, as Aaron Waldowski has mentioned, uh, if you make everyone eligible for public financing, uh, uh, everyone will run. Uh, that is, everyone will run except those uh, who have the well-paid job of campaign man manager. Uh, uh, so you have to have some kind of limitation uh, uh, on, on who's eligible, and most of the formula, as far as I can determine, seem to make uh, eligible for public financing uh, uh, those candidates uh, who have some kind of relatively widespread support out in the community, which in most cases uh, are those candidates who don't need public financing. Uh, I, I want to go to a second point, which is... Well, on, that, on that point, Ralph, yeah. uh, there's the problem of, of measuring the support by the performance in the last election, which well, seems to right. be a serious constitutional problem and a, a yeah. major policy problem because it sort of freezes things. Uh, it allows uh, Henry Wallace to run. I mean, uh, well, it would have allowed Henry Wallace to run a second time, but not the first and uh, George Wallace to run all the time because he started early. And That's doesn't the raise the question of primary support at all. And doesn't raise... And uh, you know, it's bad policy and, and very dubious uh, law. Um, on the other hand, if you, if you uh, go to the uh, petition system or something like, like the systems for getting on the ballot, uh, oh boy, you can raise uh, 5% or thereabouts, which 10% uh, of signatures on a vegetarian ticket. You can do anything. 5% of the American people will come out for anything. If you pay enough money to the solicitors to get the signatures, well, in the you first get a little seat money. Yeah. So you raise the money to get the signatures, so that you can get the money to compensate the people who raise the a, money. But it's an excellent investment. I think there might be a device that would perform the function that has now to be performed in the light of recent events, namely reassuring the public that unknown vicious special interests are contributing money and thereby uh, unknowingly getting special advantage. And also to deal with another of the after effects of Watergate, which is to dissuade uh, decent people from contributing to candidates because they're afraid they'll be smeared. If we had a public mechanism, like a kind of general campaign office, whose sole functions were these, to rule on the legality of contributions and to publicize them. The basic rule would be that no candidate or any committee in his behalf 
could spend money on radio or television or newspapers or mail orders, which I take it our big expenditures are, with cash. Their money for that candidate would go to the general campaign office, which would give them a chit. And only with this chit could you buy time or deal with newspapers, and they would be forbidden to accept cash. They would also, this general campaign office, would also make the statement at the end of uh, the campaign of who has spent how much. Now, what this would do would be to give a reasonable guarantee that the big money, at least, was accounted for, because there'd be no point in contributing large sums of money that didn't go for these kinds of purposes. I think one also has to talk about uh uh, public financing, uh, and this uh, draws on, on some of what, what has been said, that uh, uh, in adjusting these formulae uh, uh, before every election, uh, it's very easy to discriminate. It's very much like the question of when, when will the primary date be held? Uh, uh, there's all kinds of incumbent office holders who say, gee, uh, campaigns are too long. Uh, let's hold the primary a week or two before the uh, general election, uh, uh, save the public money and all that. And, 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 and it's the same kind of thing that can go on in adjusting these formula. There was also the question of the effect on parties, which, which we have discussed, which uh, is, is something which I find um, uh, uh, very difficult to fathom. No, it, it, it's just total speculation to try and guess what will happen to our parties and the strength of our parties uh, if we pass these schemes. Finally, fourth, uh, uh, an, an issue which uh, seems attractive um, uh, only to me and the president, uh, uh, which is the issue of uh, government coercion in matters of conscience. Uh, this can be raised, and I've, and I've tried to raise it with uh, a noticeable lack of success uh, as a constitutional issue. Uh, but it does seem, but I, I have difficulty with the proposition that the government can uh, come to people and take their money and use their money to support ideological causes which uh, they're indifferent to or which they, which they abhor. Uh, I, I, I realize that, we, that uh, we live in a society in which government coerces people to do an awful lot of things. Uh, but when it comes to religion, uh, we respect uh, this point on conscious, conscience. When it comes to the draft and people have conscientious scruples about war, we respect it. Uh, and I would really hope that in, that in a society like this, we might also uh, respect it when it comes to uh, one's political beliefs. Uh, it seems to me to reduce political beliefs to uh, an insignificant level, to a demeaning level, uh, to say it's something, in, uh, uh, it's the kind of thing in which someone can be coerced to support that uh, which he doesn't believe in. Well, I wanted to, to defend the public horror about some aspects of campaign financing, what I think is the public horror, and that is that large segments of the public, I believe, genuinely think that campaign financing, as now practiced, is corrupt. That is to say, large amounts of money are raised from groups, and corporations, and unions in exchange for favors. Now, it's hard for people to prove this one way or the other, but they believe it. And I happen to think they're right in this limited sense. We do have a series of public campaign finance laws on the books today. Every time we pass an oil import quota law or a depletion allowance or set up the Civil Aeronautics Board to decide who can fly an airplane from one city to another or the Interstate Commerce Commission to decide what you can charge on a trucking route from Chicago to Peoria or the Federal Communications Commission that can decide whether or not you can broadcast and on what frequency and uh, what locations and whether you can also own a newspaper. Whenever we do these things, we give to low visibility government officials enormous discretionary power over important segments of the economy. And I don't see why we should be surprised that when we look at the list of people who have given enormous and often illegal sums of money to the government, that list tends to be headed when it's involved with corporations at least, the airlines, the oil companies, the broadcast companies, the milk producers. They are regulated or subsidized or both. Now, no one has to say convincingly that in exchange for this campaign money, people in government make decisions that nakedly and clearly favor the big giver because most people who give this money give it to both parties and it kind of cancels it out. Milk producers, I'm sure, uh, give money to as many Democrats as they do to Republicans. But the public sees this as an elaborate, though not very efficient, shakedown. I suspect the people who are giving the money see it as an elaborate and not very efficient shakedown. <laughs> now, all this talk about campaign finance reform and eliminating the incentives for real or imagined corruption, 
without talking about the powerful incentive that exists now built into our system of regulation for, by hints and indirection, and the subtle messages of Mr. Kalmbach and his equivalents on the Democratic side, that you must give money in order to guarantee that you will not suffer your vital interest being harmed. Uh, that, without discussing that, it's just pointless, because uh, that's where the money comes from, except from those people who, for ideological or personal or friendship reasons, happen to, to give large amounts of money. Now, that, that really you leads know, to limitations right. on giving. It shifts from uh, uh, limitations on campaign expenditures wouldn't touch this problem. Public financing might not if you also allow uh, the candidate to raise additional money or, or to have an option of raising it. But the problem would be directly met by limitations on giving, which is really the, the history of our election. No, uh, it would reform. not. I, I, if I understand uh, Jim correctly, what we would have to do is alter the incentive by getting the government out of this endless business of regulation, which on the one hand does not achieve its direct purpose, but on the other creates a need among the regulated to influence government. Let, let's be policy. realistic. That's the radical you're not, you're not going to do, <laughs> do that. that. And I think the point you made, there, Aaron, about the possibility in some way of assuring total publicity, I think there's less likely that the public will have this view, which they certainly have now. I couldn't agree more. That uh, It is an article of faith that somehow the party and the candidate is beholden to the people who put up the money. And there's enough, there are enough instances of fact in this to, to uh, make one at least think there's a great deal of fire where the smoke exists. Well, but but changing how do you the get away from it? Going to change that. I mean, yes, it will. I would well, suggest it I'd would. I take the Agnew example. And Mr. Agnew and the supporters of campaign reform have both said, look at the Agno example as something that, that uh, our, our bills would change. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Agnew had, when he was governor of Maryland and county executive, discretionary power to reward people uh, uh, through various kinds of regulation. Uh, he took money not as campaign financing, he took money for personal use. You could have every reform that Common Cause and all of these uh, uh, split-off organizations uh, want, you could have had that in the state of Maryland that whole time, and Mr. Agnew still would have taken the money, they still would yeah, have given that, the money. Yeah, but that, that's, that's an argument that's, that proves too much. That, yeah, that, that's, that's right. That exactly. says that no matter what reform or what law we, we put on the books, it will be uh, breakable. Some, some dishonest fellow can break it and can do something dishonest no matter what it says on the books. No, it uh, just says that if, if, however, if you have one is bothered, corruption, the corruption will continue that's in correct. a different form. That's, that's all it says. Well, that's and that doesn't that, prove too that'll, much. That'll be, that'll be, why don't you pass two laws? The first is the law against venality. Nobody shall be corrupt. Yes, and the second is the one they usually advocate in Latin America, the law that says that all the other laws should be enforced. To come back to uh, uh, limitations, what, what is the uh, decisive objection to uh, establishing reasonable limits, maybe uh, oh, $5,000 or so per individual, um, forbidding or limiting corporate and other uh, <coughs> corporate and, and uh, labor union, but not, not necessarily uh, other organizations, uh, political ad hoc organizations where people just uh, come together with small contributions, forbidding and, and limiting uh, those contributions, and tightening the enforcement of that by uh, involving the uh, Controller General, as, as the uh, 71 Act uh, uh, does, uh, combining it with publicity, although I wouldn't let the publicity uh, publication go below uh, Hundred and fifty or two hundred dollar contribution. Now, of course, it can be evaded. It, it, it's not going to cure the Agnew case. It's not going to cure anything. Uh, no law ever does. A fellow who wants to violate will violate it. Um, but wouldn't it meet what I agree is an enormously serious problem, namely the widespread public cynicism that uh, politicians uh, sell government services, whether they do it overtly or, or uh, by quiet understandings. What, what is the objection to that? Well, I, it, you know, it, it seems to me it might cure the cynicism, but it might do something else to the political process that, that uh, might, be, might be very disruptive. Um, uh, campaign contributions perform a, a number of functions uh, which allow people to participate in the political process beyond casting a ballot. Uh, this allows them, uh, I would quote uh, 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 one of my favorite authors, Alex Bickle, on this, allows them to register intensely uh, uh, felt views and needs. I thought in bucks is pretty intense. Uh, well, but, but uh, let me say it may be important. Now, for instance, uh, 
Uh, suppose somebody feels strongly about something like the defense of Israel. If he's allowed only to vote in his particular home district, uh, that may be a very, very limited say uh, on the issue. Uh, there may be some need to, uh, 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 to, to engage in activities beyond the district, some need to register the intensity of feeling. And as far as 5,000 bucks being too much, uh, most of the time, most of the time those contributions uh, uh, the people who make those contributions are functional representatives of other people with less money who also feel very intensely about well, the issue. Now, it seems to me that... But all that can be met. All right, so it's well, 10000 and it's per candidate. You're not restricted to uh, your total contribution to, to several candidates over the country, for example. If you're interested in Israel, you want to contribute to all kinds of congressmen. Uh, all that can be left open. What it does is meet the, uh, the, the spectacle of a Vesco or of somebody dumping $250,000. He may not get anything out of it, and yesterday's cross-examination <laughs> tends to demonstrate that he didn't, but it's ugly. And, well, and, it, and people, people think don't like it. Something. People think yeah, it's ugly. Well, right. people think it's ugly. On the other and hand, sometimes it is ugly. Let's not, you know. but, but, <laughs> well, I assume that when it is really ugly, it'll happen anyway, because mm -hmm. they'll evade the law. But, but take the case of an issue that people are beginning to feel deeply about. Uh, uh, this seems to me a paradigm case. Uh, you have people, candidates, wanting to raise it. They're unlikely, uh, a lot of times, and particularly in the nominating process, uh, unlikely to be able to raise the kind of substantial funds they might need unless they can find themselves some kind of uh, a fairly wealthy uh, person or persons to bankroll them for a while. It's a seed money function. It's a perfectly reputable function and a terribly important function uh, uh, in the political process. As you have heard, there are many views on even the single topic how should campaigns be paid for? Next, our AEI roundtable guests plunge into another area, equally complex. What kind of a presidency do we need and want? Again, Professor Bickle. We pass now to a discussion of the second topic that we set for this uh, evening, and that is uh, the problem of the office of the presidency, if it is a problem, and its function. Aaron? You're a student of the presidency. I have concluded that there are only three things that can be said about Watergate with absolute certainty. The first is that we will not see a repetition of its like again uh, for the next 20 or 25 years because the sanctions it has already imposed are so great and therefore we don't have to guard against it. You know the usual tradition to generals to fight the last war and I think that would be unnecessary. I think the second absolute certainty is that we will once again yet more without doubt want a president who will override a conservative court and a recalcitrant Congress. There will come a time when we feel the need is for action and energy and dispatch and we will not truck any opposition to our then hero. I think the third thing, of course, is that Watergate doesn't have any lessons. Watergate is a raw shock. If you want to know what anybody thinks is wrong with the country, ask him what Watergate has to teach us. If you want to know what's deep inside of any person, ask what he or she thinks of with Watergate and you will get that uh, <laughs> response. My feeling see, is that I, I like checks and balances. I, I like the separation of powers, I like conflict, therefore I want all our institutions to be invigorated. I'd like to see Congress gain more control over its ancient power of the purse, and I'd like to see the courts take on some of their responsibilities in the area of crime more forcefully and leave some of the more political areas in which that they have invaded alone and so on. But I don't think there's anything you can learn. Let me just give a few examples. One thing that's suggested is that somehow the Senate ought to confirm the president's closest advisors. Why, Watergate shows us that uh, he won't even take advice or even see people he himself has appointed. <laughs> what are you going to do? You'll, you'll uh, ask for the confirmation of somebody, and he'll sit in a little office, and after six months of no papers arriving at the desk, <laughs> he's going to go home. I'm opposed, of course, to the six-year term because I'm, I don't think Richard Nixon deserves to have an amendment named after him. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, the third anti... All we've really done 
to use the phrase of the lawyers that hard cases make bad law, is we have an anti-third term amendment, which now guarantees if we ever in our lifetime find a president who's worth keeping, we won't be able to. And if we didn't limit presidents to three, you know, to three term, to two terms, then nobody would think of limiting a president to, to six years as if the safety <coughs> of the country is guaranteed not by checks and balances of vigorous institutions, but uh, by taking a, uh, an electoral check away from the president. Because after all, as far as we know, Nixon did behave somewhat better in his first term, perhaps because he was concerned about an election. In any event, putting a man in office who never has to run again doesn't guarantee he won't be interested in his successor and may make him much less interested in what anybody thinks a very peculiar doctrine in a democratic country. I'll stop with the parliamentary system. The one good thing that came from the parliamentary crises in Britain and Israel is that it indicated that, or, you know, any system has its defects. And as we watched while these countries failed to get a government for some period of time, we understood that parliamentary government uh, isn't all a bed of roses. But the point I would stress here is that parliamentary government is preeminently party government. It requires an electorate that will put in either a majority party or a compatible coalition and political parties that will vigorously control their membership in parliament. Why a country that won't do anything to reform its political parties, that spends all its time thinking of ways to weaken them, would ever contemplate going to a parliamentary regime I cannot imagine. So I think that what we basically have seen are exercises in foolishness. I want to take up one point that you uh, uh, made, Aaron, um, and that is, it, well, it's, it's got two sides. Uh, uh, this president, as other presidents, have felt, and I think justly so, uh, that they come into office, they've got the mandate, and they can't get a grip on the bureaucracy. Uh, they send their uh, solicitor general or attorney general into, into the Supreme Court to argue one position on uh, busing or what have you, and uh, at the lower level, the bureaucracy in the district courts or in uh, or the bureaucracy of HEW dealing with school districts uh, follows a different policy, and you can't come to grips with it. It's a, it's a problem that isn't novel with, uh, uh, with uh, Mr. Nixon. But he tried to solve it in a way that I do think raises problems in a democratic society, uh, namely by fanning out of the White House uh, faceless people who would undermine uh, visible and accountable cabinet officers uh, and try to control uh, in that fashion. Now, sure, it's silly to ask that uh, uh, his domestic affairs assistant be uh, confirmed by the Senate, but it isn't silly, and the Constitution doesn't for nothing um, provide for great departments of government headed by men who are confirmed by the Senate. It isn't silly to insist, that, especially in a government this large, uh, there be visibility and accountability under the president. Everybody understands he can't do everything himself, uh, but what is done in his name ought to be done visibly uh, by people who in some fashion are accountable and in some sense have what have a connection uh, with the country. Uh, it's, it's a lot better for Kissinger to be Secretary of State than right. even for Kissinger to be operating out of the White House. Alex, I think that the, the problem of bureaucracy, which is great, and the president is right to be deeply concerned about it, is typically misconceived either as willful men attempting to subvert the president or uh, 20 years of Democratic appointees to the bureaucracy leaving a Republican president helpless. And I don't think either one of those uh, explanations really covers the bureaucratic behavior. And HEW <clears throat> is, is, a, is a good case of the more accurate explanation. HEW is not a bureau. It is a conglomerate. It is the ITT yes. of government. <laughs> Every bureau one can imagine whose affairs may touch uh, uh, humanity, uh, large or small, can find a niche in this huge umbrella. And those bureaus have very specially defined missions set up by different congresses to serve different publics, some to make the schools uh, richer or smaller or better or blacker or whiter, and the same uh, with uh, welfare and the same with social services and vocational rehabilitation. 
The fact that they work at cross purposes is because their purposes were set at cross purposes <laughs> by the Congress. And the problem of the president is to preside over an agency, or the problem of the secretary of HEW, preside over an agency in which, uh, without the ability to repeal some purposes and put new purposes into effect, he must tolerate this constant guerrilla warfare he's operating under, but carried on by men and women who are good-spirited, good-intentioned, and trying to do their job. Uh, again, it seems to me much like the problem of uh, economic regulation. We may not get the government we deserve, but we tend to get the government we want. Uh, we tend to get those things done that we've asked Congress to do. And Congress does it, and it creates a bureau, and acquires a life of its own, and those things go on. Um, there's no way to deal with that uh, uh, by various strategies of staffing the higher levels of government. Uh, I do agree with you, however, that the, the, the cabinet head uh, is a much maligned individual, uh, and that the maligning started not with Mr. Nixon, but with Mr. Kennedy and Mr. Johnson, uh, because they thought the government could be run by a small group of persons in the West Wing of the White House. And it cannot be. And some of them, without acknowledging their earlier error, are now admitting the error of their ways. Mr. Schlesinger in 1963, <laughs> uh, after celebrating the, the, the end of Camelot, complained that the State Department was an inefficient, incompetent, uh, backward-minded bureaucracy that every president should ignore. And now, in the imperial presidency ten years later, he's belaboring the president because it, it overlooks the accumulated wisdom and expertise <laughs> and statesmanship of our established branches of government. So I think this is this, this sort of thing just really ought not to be tolerated in public rhetoric. I'd like to pick up some more from Jim's thing, because I think there are continuities mm -hmm. from at least Kennedy through Nixon. One of these is that we have taken on increasingly social programs where we understand the inputs, namely the money, but we don't understand the outputs at all. And this frustration gets blamed on the bureaucracy. Eventually, we're going to have more than half the country in the bureaucracy, and they are going to blame themselves. I think it's inevitable development. That is, if, if we don't know how to ha have an educational program that will rapidly improve the cognitive and reading abilities of poor and deprived children, <coughs> and the bureaucracies are a scapegoat for this kind of failure as for the innumerable others of poverty programs. The first thing we do is we set impossible standards, and the second thing we do is we blame the bureaucracy for not achieving them. A second line of continuity, which I found especially blatant in the Kennedy administration, was they talk, you read Schlesinger's book and uh, the others by the staff members, they don't contemplate checks and balances. To them, the separation of powers is anathema. We have wonderful ideas. They are sabotaged out there. This first suggests the idea that if only there was cooperation, social policy would be much better, which is, I think, completely false. Presidents in the past have, have, no matter how powerful and how active and how popular and plebiscitary they regarded themselves, have acted in, within an executive company. Uh, heads of departments, people with some constituencies, constituencies of their own, not bureaucracy, but, but people of some standing and heads of departments. If, if uh, FDR uh, didn't like what Jesse Jones was doing, he had to negotiate with him because Jesse Jones was a power of some sort. Now, the Nixon scheme was to have faced it, to do it out of the White House, to have faceless men in cabinet office, to deinstitutionalize the immediate surroundings of the presidency. And that, I must say, seems to me to connect with a, with a psychology that can lead to a war again. That, the plebiscitary notion, the, the, the notion that the president, once elected, uh, that, that, that an election is the conclusion and culmination and the end of a political process until the next, uh, until the But the, I the think, Alex, we time. have really here to go back to what Jim said before. And this applies to Mr. Nixon and to the Johnson administration, the Kennedy administration, and to some extent to the Truman administration. As government becomes more the Goliath, as we expect government to do so much more than we ever did, even say during the Depression, when I was growing up as a kid, when we expect it to regulate this, regulate that, solve this, solve that, make horse harnesses fit for every type of horse, uh, also good for anything else you may have in mind, uh, take it here, take it there, do this, do that, instant answers, and besides get the answer in yesterday. 
When you expect all these things, and when many political leaders on both sides of the aisle in Congress, many searchers after presidential nominations are prepared to promise so much, I think of some of the discussions on health insurance that are going on now, both in and out of the government, between those proposing plans in the Senate and from the president himself. The, the promises that are being made, the hopes that are being held out here are so enormous that I think uh, Aaron's view about half the population being in the bureaucracy would have to be approached as a minimal goal within a very, very few years. The fact is that if you see government as the answer man, if you see government as the supplier, if you see government as the fount, you're obviously going to have a lot of the troubles that uh, Professor Schlesinger has described in his imperial presidency uh, uh, that you regard with a certain sense of value, shall we say, Jim? Uh, and uh, I just don't know how you're going to beat this. I don't know really how you're going to avoid, in the long run, a, a cycle of frustration until you get to the hero figure that Aaron quite properly points out, comes in because he can cut the Gordian knot. We come and then he becomes the hero man, and then you reelect him eight times and change the Constitution. This is the, you know, the, it, it, it's very interesting you say this, and you talk about the frustration. Because almost all of the calls for reform that, that, that we hear after Watergate, we were hearing with only a little less intensity before Watergate right. and from the same people. But Watergate really is... And, and it's right. These calls followed the great society. Yes. And they are resu a result, I think, of the frustration over the failure of the great society, the unwillingness of the advocates of the great society to admit that it failed. Oh, yes. And they're searching around to find some... Somebody to point their finger at, and so it's it's campaign financing. I think your problem really is to establish some kind of norms of what you can reasonably expect from these institutions. Not expect instant answers from them. Not expect the bureaucracy to change overnight. Not expect anything to come up seven, twenty-eight times in a row, which is really what we expect it to do. And so if you that... establish more reasonable norms, you may find that uh, the exacerbations of a Watergate become more tolerable. So that our answers here are more attitudinal and psychological and structural. They may well be. They may well be. Well, thank you very much. I think that concludes our evening's program. This roundtable discussion has brought you the views of six knowledgeable experts who have differing opinions on the basic causes and possible cures for the American political spectacular called Watergate. It is the aim of the American Enterprise Institute to illuminate issues of the day by presenting many such views in the hope that by so doing, those in decision-making positions will benefit from such a free exchange of informed and enlightened opinion. This is Peter Hackus in Washington. Washington Debates for the 70s is created and supplied to this station as a public service by the American Enterprise Institute, Washington, D.C.